Hi, and welcome to Faith, Art, and Tiny Houses. I'm your host, Carmen Shank. Welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm sharing an interview with Felice Cohen. She is the author of five books. She's a professional organizer, a motivational speaker, and a Holocaust educator. You might have seen Felice in that infamous YouTube video of her 90 square foot Manhattan studio. She moved into that tiny space for one reason. The low rent allowed her to quit her full-time job and finish writing her first book, What Papa Told Me, a memoir about her grandfather, a Holocaust survivor. She planned to stay only one year, but something happened during that one year. Her life got better. It got larger. Today I'm sharing an excerpt from an interview I did for Simplify My Life Virtual Summit. The rest of this interview is available at simplifymy.life. I found this tiny apartment. The rent was low and it allowed me to quit my full-time stressful job. And I yeah. found it for a year. And at the end of that year, my life was just so different and so much better. And my stress was gone and I was happy and I was doing what I loved. And I said, I want to stay. And um, I just, I just kept staying and I loved cool. it. Yeah. My life had just changed dramatically. And I was in the middle of Manhattan. I was a block from Central Park. I had so much more time to do what I loved to do. Central Park was my backyard. I mean, there's oh, cool. a fairway and you can buy prepared foods. Um, there's a lot of Mediterranean and there's oh, cool. sushi and you just name it. Yeah. It's right there. So anything is right at your fingertips. Anything. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So what was the transition like? What did you come from and how long did it take you to get used to this normal, this 90 square foot normal, which I believe was at the top of, of five flights of stairs? Yeah. Just full walk up. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm home on Cape Cod right now where I grew up. And yeah. My- bedroom here is like 20 feet by 20 feet and I have two walk-in closets that together were almost 90 square feet and that's how I grew up and I always thought oh I'll live in a large home when I grew up and yeah. I lived in New York in the Bronx with my uncle in a two-bedroom fairly big size apartment mm-hmm. then I wanted to try living in Manhattan and I, I wanted to finish my, writing my grandfather's book and I found this tiny space and I thought it's just for a year yeah. how bad could it be and I put all right. the boxes of stuff in the storage and it had a loft bed which most people have seen and commented on and Mm -hmm. only at 23 inches between the top of the mattress and the ceiling. And the first night I did have a panic attack. Yeah. And I thought, what was I thinking? I ran out of the space. I almost fell down the ladder. And I I had a friend stay over. I thought I would fall out maybe that first night. And and Mm -hmm. I was lying on the floor on my yoga mat and she dropped down a pillow and she said, I was like, what was I thinking? I'm going to die here. And she said, why did you agree to live here? And without hesitation, I said, to finish writing my grandfather's book. And, and that book was about the five years my grandfather spent in the Holocaust. And I oh, wow. Stories. He told me of being hungry for five years of oh, my goodness. wooden cots and this horrible life for five years. And I looked around yeah. this tiny apartment and I thought, this is paradise. Oh, Come my on. perspective. Total. Wow. And, and after that, I never had a panic attack again. And, okay. and I loved it up in that little space. It became like my safe haven. And, okay. and I realized so much of what we react to is just our attitude. Yeah. Well, actually that's, I I love that you mentioned that because I'm, (laughs) I'm not an underliner. So I'm just going to read you this paragraph because this was the one thing that I underlined in the book because it had to be underlined. (laughs) In all my unpacking, I had forgotten about my reason for moving in the first place. That was when I had another aha moment for the next 12 months, I would live in 90 square feet as well as walk up five flights. All this would require some major adjustment. Well, really just one, my attitude. So what was, what was all a part of that for you? What, um, what was the mindset shift? What was the attitude? What was, how did you adapt? I mean, naturally you had perspective. Your grandfather gave you perspective. Was there anything else to that that brought about this ability to be Um, adaptable in this way? Sure. You know what? I've spoken a lot about how to prepare to live tiny. And one, there's the physical, there's the get rid of stuff. And that's, that's the, really the easy part. The other is is the mental. It is. And it's preparing to live tiny. And and I always say it's good to have your why. And whether it's, you want to save money for a couple of years, you 
want to be greener, you want to pay off debt, you just want to try it, you want to travel, whatever the reason. And, and my, my why was so that I could finish writing this book about my grandfather. He'd never asked me for anything. And this was the one thing. And, and I said to myself, I quit my stressful job. Mm -hmm. I still was organizing some clients, but I was waking up every day. This tiny place, though it was a little hard at first, allowed me to wake up and do what I wanted to do. Yeah. Like I'm wearing this hat. I just got off my bike. I you know, <laughs> rode 30 miles this morning. It allows you to do the things you love to do. And right. that's a small space. It's maybe fewer things in a larger space. So you're not spending time cleaning. And, and yeah. for me, having that why, were there times I thought, oh, I wish I had a couch I could lie down on or make scrambled eggs? Yeah, there were a few times. Mm -hmm. And it was like a bummer, but I would remind myself of my why. Yeah. And once I did that, I was like, okay, it was a fleeting passing moment, but every day my life was what I wanted to do with it. Oh, cool. And uh, that was great. And so that was a way of living intentionally for you. You chose that life very specifically because your why was powerful enough that you would make the sacrifices that you needed to make to reach it. Totally. And I think that's, that's yeah. great. So uh, how did the, the, pro the idea of making that video come about? So I didn't make the video. I was writing columns for a couple newspapers in New York, opinion columns, and they found out I lived tiny and they asked me to write about how to organize a tiny space. Yeah. And a woman from the New York Post wrote an article on me and some others who lived tiny. And from that, since it's an international newspaper, I was contacted by Kirsten Durst, who makes, uh, Dirksen, who makes um, videos of tiny places around the world. And she- Oh, cool. And okay. She said, Can I make one of yours? And I said, yeah, in about an hour oh. and a half got all the footage she needed. I didn't even think about it. And then oh all of a sudden it landed like months later on the homepage of Yahoo and a day it got a million and a half hits and just. Oh my goodness. So your private space went viral. Yeah. A lot of people have seen me sitting on a toilet hitting my knee against the tub. That was fun. But yeah. <laughs> so yeah. How does that feel? I mean, it's your private space. Uh, at 90 square feet, it's not like you're having dinner parties and to show your house off a lot. So what does it feel like when suddenly a million people have virtually tromped through your house? I mean, you know, I'm an organizer. So for me, seeing the space was really kind of seeing my final project. I mean, it was oh, okay. years and years of organizing. And for me, I was happy to show how I lived. Yeah, um, how to organize a small space or any space. And there were, you know, there's over 21 million views now and oh still people are commenting. And some wow. people were angry. And I always found that interesting. And I wasn't telling anyone, oh, you have to live tiny. I was just showing and saying how living tiny made my life better, made yeah. my life larger. And I realized the anger people felt was because, you know, it goes against living tiny, goes against the American dream, mm. um, living in a big house filled with stuff. But, you know, my dad's a bit, was a bankruptcy attorney and you can learn how quickly that dream wow. can turn into a nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, you can't afford the mortgage one month and right. something else happens. And, and I just was kind of saying you can live so happy with fewer possessions. So what support systems were in your life as you made that transition that helped you? <laughs> well, everybody thought it was nuts. Um, my family was like, really? They thought I was moving into a death trap. My niece, oh. four at the time, thought I lived in a jungle gym. Oh. They loved it. Um, my uncle let me keep my bike at his apartment in the Bronx, so that helped. Um, but it was really just, I just kept saying my reason was so I could focus on this. And, yeah. and then when my grandfather's book finally came out, I just remember standing on the sidewalk, calling him and just crying. Oh, it was wow. like, it was all so worth it. And, um, oh, that's I so cool. It was, it was, yeah, it was, that's a moment. That's a real moment. Yeah. A life moment. Yeah. It was great. And, you know, after five years of being in this tiny space, I never really thought, you know, I wasn't really thinking moving, but when I was on good morning America, the landlord saw me and realized I was not, I was subletting and I wasn't supposed to sublet. So I got evicted. And oh. that, so I started looking and I was looking for other rentals, but everything was three or four times more expensive. And I remember, but because of this video, I was suddenly speaking around the country about my grandfather and about the book. And I was down in Florida doing a week of talks. And one night my grandfather and I are in the kitchen eating ice cream. And I told him I was having a hard time finding a new rental. And he said, why don't you buy a place already? He said, I'm going to give you the down payment. And I just, Oh, cool. Great. 
And he said, you know, you lived in a shoebox, so you could write about ah! your life and help you enjoy yours. Oh gosh, I'm gonna have and, a moment. Yeah, oh, that's really I, yeah. cool. It was amazing, and um, I came back to New York, and the first place I looked at, <laughs> I bought. Yeah. And, oh, cool. Uh, I just called him up when I moved in, and uh, and I just said thank you, and he said, go buy yourself a nice couch, enjoy. There your you life. go. So it, more it really for you. <laughs> oh, that's great. So he's so much a part of your living tiny story. Tell us a little bit about who your grandfather was. Sure. So, uh, yeah, he was born in Poland and he was about 17 when the Holocaust, the war began, World War yeah. II. And he had four sisters. He had a brother, his parents and everybody, you know, he was 17. He was taken away to go to four labor camps and then four concentration camps. And he never saw his family except for one sister again. Wow. In telling me these stories, you know, they were just, how do you live through something like that? Right. And it, we worked on the book for about 18 years on and off stories and, and I remember, you know, after the book came out, it really just took a life of its own. Thank, thankful for this video, for the tiny house video, because at first when the video went viral, I would get emails from people saying, oh, how cool. I love your tiny space. But then the, the email said, I bought your book. Your grandfather's a hero. And these were coming from Germany, from Poland, from oh, cool. China, from Australia, yes, around the world. Yes. And I would call my grandfather up and read him these emails and you can ah! see him smiling. So, oh, I mean, that's cool. the fact that I was able to do this for him was just, it's like, it was like fate. It was like kismet that I moved into this tiny place just to finish that book. And then the yeah. tiny place, you know, just made this book um, around the world and oh, cool. it translated to Polish. Japanese is coming oh, wow. in soon. Yeah. It's taught in schools. It was endorsed by Ellie Wazell. And, and I haven't, you know, I'm a Holocaust educator now. I go around the country and I speak and it's thanks to my grandfather. You know, I, I, you know, I speak at tiny house festivals. I bring both books because I end up selling yeah. a lot of my grandfather's books because it's in my story. Yeah, absolutely. I have a tiny story is because of my grandfather and, mm -hmm. um, and both ways, you know, it's, it's, I'm blessed. I'm lucky. Well, I love how, and I see this so often. I love how going tiny and minimizing things that really didn't matter that much to you opened up this opportunity for a relationship that you might not have been able to have in the same way, uh, a project, a passion project for you that is now out in the world. And that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that's a really amazing thing. I think so many people are like, oh, I want to write the book someday, but are never quite getting around to A, making the sacrifice, or B, just making space, whatever that looks like. Right. And so that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, tell me about these fancy tales. <laughs> I got to read the line. These are modern day New York City versions of classic fairy tales. They are wholesomely presented and slightly sophisticated. Gay twist. <laughs> I'm still laughing over slightly sophisticated because, you know, there is such a thing as too, too sophisticated. Sure, so tell me sure. about the fancy tales. Sure. So they came about maybe 18 years ago or something. My gra I'm named after my maternal grandmother. Uh, her okay. name was Fella. So one day somebody said something and they just said, oh, she's a fella. She's like a fella or something. And I thought like Cinderella, she's a fella. So they are like Cinderella. It's called She's a Fella. And instead of a glass slipper, it's a Doc Martin. And it just, these, <laughs> these, fails are, these fairy tales are you know, like exactly like Cinderella, except they've just got a gay twist. So okay. two girls meet or Peter Pansy um, and his great grandfather was like the Indian tribe from the Tappan Zee Bridge and yeah. um, just cute, funny things like that. And just to have a twist. Um, so again, something. another passion project, working to make a story uh, like you're doing with your grandfather, letting a story be out there in the world that maybe has been undertold. For sure. I mean, I so guess you know, when kids, especially today, kids know that they're gay when they're younger and right. they don't see those fairy tales. It's like, oh, well, let's just put them out there. They're funny and campy and, you know, they'd make fun little TV shows or something too. I think it'd be fun to see. Um, you know, it's just fun. Well, we'll see you on Good Morning America yeah. <laughs> for that one. That would be great. A, a great series. I could totally see that. <laughs> yeah. What would you say to somebody who's considering going tiny, uh, whether it's uh, whatever it looks like, if it's a teensy tiny little closet apartment in Manhattan or a house on wheels or a sprinter van or whatever, what would you say to somebody who's 
thinking about giving it a whirl? You know, I think before you do anything, before you get rid of those extra socks and all that Tupperware, I think like we were talking about earlier, having your why. Yeah. And sometimes if you give yourself a parameter, I'm going to try it for a year, you might not feel so freaked out. And maybe you put some stuff in a storage for a year and you give yourself that time to try it out, but you really have to have your why. And I've talked to so many people at so many tiny house festivals all around the country, even in Canada as well. Oh, cool. About why they're deciding. I always say, are you interested in going tiny or you just want to see what the freaks are doing? I mean, <laughs> and they are like, well, I, I see kids like going, preparing to go to college and they say, right. I want to a tiny house or people retiring and they want to let go of some of their stuff and travel so they can see their kids. Or some people say, you know what? I can't afford this large home. It, it's a good starter. I, you know, and, and I think having that reason why is very important. Um, not just doing it because I, Hey, I'm going to try it because everybody else is doing it. You're going to wake up with a panic attack and that's not going to go away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. And I think for a lot of people, the first step might be not even going tiny, but seeing what you can live without. What can we get yeah. rid of? And when I go work with a client, they're overwhelmed and they don't know sure. where to begin. And, and what I'm trying to do, I don't tell anybody, oh, you have to get rid of that, is I try to help them see what their lives could be like with fewer things. And no matter what size place you're in, you, can, you only take up so much space. It's your stuff that yeah. takes up more space that requires you to have a large home. Um, because, you know, Murphy's Law, we fill that space with yeah, stuff. We do. We do. Um, you know, for me, living tiny made my life larger. You know, this video went global and now I speak around the country and it, and it opens you up and, and with stuff, I feel like when you can let go of some of the stuff from your past, it's going to open doors. It's going to open you up to new experiences. Um, I love to tell the story. I had this client who had her wedding dress. It took up almost a whole closet in Brooklyn Heights and, you know, space is limited. And I said to her, how long have you been divorced? And she said, five years. I said, is this dress bringing you good memories? And she said, oh, wow. Said, Why can't you get rid of it? And she said, because it costs a lot of money. Oh. And I understand that. Sure. Um, because, you know, there are a lot of things that we look around. We cost a lot of money, but, mm -hmm. but is it worth it? Because you're paying, you're paying to store that stuff. Even though it's in your closet, that's stuff you could use for something else. And, mm -hmm. and I encouraged her to sell it. And I'm not kidding. Months later, she met someone. So she was. <gasps> so I said, you know, look, you get rid of those things you're holding on to. Sometimes yeah. it's blocking us. And, you know, maybe it was coincidence, but I really believe that it, it opens you up because stuff, when you see stuff around your home, it's telling your brain, you need to do that. You need to clean that up. You need to go through that. And that's putting pressure on you. Yeah. That Whether you recognize you it or not. Right. Yeah. Because it's not anymore that we own the stuff. The stuff is owning us Yeah, and nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. So do you see like letting go as a muscle or how would you describe it? Is that it's a muscle to exercise or a mindset? How does, how does it feel to you? Well, you know, when you get rid of a lot of stuff, everybody feels so much lighter. And for me, because I mean, not that I have that much stuff, but in that process of getting rid of stuff, I felt lighter. I felt freer. And soon I had more money. I wasn't paying storage. Yeah. So you just feel like I'm in control of my life now. Yeah. Um, and I teach an online course to seniors. They're in their 70s, 80s, 90s. And this one woman's 97 years old. Stuff follows us way up until the end. And, and they have questions like, how can I get rid of this? I've had it. It was my husband's. He's been gone for 20 years. And it's a process. Oh. Yeah. But you should enjoy the process and go through it and say, you know what, you know, this was my husband's pen and, and they can tell me a story about it. And then it's okay to give it to someone else cool. because you shared an experience. Um, you do feel lighter. Sometimes it feels like losing weight. If you've really okay. been trying, you know, when you, you, maybe you're trying to lose 10 pounds, you lose two, you're motivated to keep trying harder. Mm -hmm. And it's like that with stuff. Once you can see the top of the couch, or the top of the dining room table, or you can open a cabinet without something falling on your head. Yeah. You feel better. You mm -hmm. feel lighter. And, um, and it's, yeah, I think you learn to do it and it's not hard to do. And, you know, I, I try to have simple steps, simple lessons from my book to make it less overwhelming. It's like, cool. it's, you see your whole closet, where do you begin? But if you just right. your socks or you just do your t-shirts and then go for a walk and that's all, maybe one day you just do that. 
Okay. So do you recommend taking it in small little pieces and, and just one project at a time kind of thing? Yeah, I say baby steps. Um, if yeah. I, I always have people start with shoes because that's usually okay. And then maybe socks. And then when you do one, you realize that took me eight minutes. All right, that wasn't that hard. Let me just right. do it anywhere. Or yeah. let me just do t-shirts, you know? And, and if you break it down like that, it's like writing a book. You don't write the whole book. You've got to break it down into chapters and paragraphs and, you know, and, and words yeah. and step by step. Okay. So if I can uh, clean out and downsize my house, I can probably write a book. Absolutely. I really love what Felice says about being really clear on your why. And so I, I really love that part of this conversation. I love the whole conversation. She's such a fascinating person. But I think that's one thing I want to leave you with today. Think about what is your why? Why would you go tiny? Why would you make some short-term sacrifices? Is there something else you want to gain? Is there some long-term goal that you have? Is there something that has been a part of your story for some time that you've been wanting but haven't had the time, the space to uh, create? then here's your opportunity to really pull that out and give it some consideration. It's January. It's the beginning of a new year. This is the time to really think through what you really want from life. And so I really loved that question that she asked, what's your why? The second thing that I really appreciated that she said was, what's your time frame? Are you going in for a year, two, three? If you don't go into it saying, I'm going tiny for life, (laughs) can you see how that would kind of back off the overwhelm? Think about a time frame. If you're going to go tiny for a year or two, that's fantastic. And it gives you the opportunity to continue. It doesn't lock you in, but it also keeps you out of overwhelm, which I think is fantastic. We went into living tiny in 125 square feet. For some reason, I had done some math and decided that the break-even point for us was two years. We needed to live tiny for two years. Otherwise, we would have spent more money than we would have saved by if we would have stayed in our the apartment that we'd been in. So I'm not really sure how I got to that math. I really don't. I've not been able to recreate it. But <laughs> so we went tiny thinking that we were going to be in it for two years. The reality was it was closer to three and a half, which was great because because we went in saying two years, um, it didn't let us bail too soon. And I think that's fantastic. Some people can go into tiny living and and just not be prepared for what it's going to require and maybe not have a very clear why. If you're following a trend, this is not going to work for you. (laughs) If you're not comfortable with making some short-term sacrifices in order to gain something long-term that's of much more value to you, this is going to be a really hard transition. So think in terms of what's your why and what's your time frame. Make it short you're just going to trick yourself into getting into it. And (laughs) you may find like Felice did that you turn around five years later and you're not finished. You're not ready to quit this life because so much has opened up as a result. And so I really appreciate that about her story. And it resonates with me because it's so much a part of our story as well. We went tiny expecting it to be a two year thing, a means to an end. And nope, it's we're still with it. It's the lessons that we learned are very much a part of us. And we're not walking away from this, um, this life, this community anytime soon. So thank you for joining me today. And if you want to hear more of the interview between uh, Felice and I, go to simplifymy.life and uh, click on her picture and you'll be able to catch not just the podcast and the show notes, but also the longer, um, more complete interview that we did for the simplifymy.life virtual summit. So thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. You can follow me on Instagram at Carmen Rose Shank. You can subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Please do. And you can download us on iTunes. Theme music is composed by William Kirkpatrick. Lyrics by Louise Estead. Arranged and performed by classical guitarist Jonathan Crispin. Show notes available at CarmenShank.com.